Okay, well. Is this better? All right. One of the things I want to talk about today is the blessings of God are different than the blessings of man. You see, when we come and we try to bring those blessings upon ourselves, maybe we do it through disobedience, or maybe we do it through deception. We're like the story in the gospel. You remember the story in the gospel where... God was talking, he said, why do you call me teacher? Why do you call me master? And yet you don't obey me. <laughs> he says, when you listen and when you do my will, you're like a man who builds his house on the rock, on a solid foundation. And the storms come and the wind comes and the rain comes and the waves come and the house stands solid. He said, but when you don't listen to me, you're like a man who builds his house upon the sand. The winds come, the storm comes, the rain comes, and what happens to the house? It falls flat. <laughs> it falls flat. And so when we try to bring about God's blessing on our own, through deception, through disobedience, deception, we see that in the reading that Pastor Amidas gave us, both Rebecca and, and Jacob, tried to bring about a blessing through deception. Through disobedience, we see that through Isaac. Isaac was disobedient. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. When we try to bring about God's blessings through that, we're going to fall flat, just like the house. Our legacy, our blessings, our dreams are going to fall flat. Now, God in this story intervenes. Because remember, when we were talking about Abraham weeks ago, we said that when God made the covenant, when God made the promise to Abraham, God made the covenant within himself. He didn't make the covenant with Abraham. Abraham didn't participate in the covenant blessing. God was, uh, made that covenant within himself. And so God kept the covenant here. Even though Isaac disobeyed, even though Jacob and Rebecca disobeyed, God still brought about the covenant. Why? Because God knew that by blessing Abraham, who would bless Isaac, he would bless Jacob, he would bless Joseph, and all the way down through, who would God eventually bring? Jesus, the Messiah. And so in spite of their disobedience, in spite of their deception, the blessing comes about. God desires to bless our lives. He desires to give us blessings. We're his children. And I want to talk about when God brings a blessing. Maybe you're wondering, is God blessing my life? How do I know? Let's look at what's required when we receive a blessing from God. And take out your insert that's in your bulletin. Uh, there's a sermon note insert. If you're in the habit of taking notes, I encourage you to use that. If not, write down two or three important facts you want to take home with you and remember from today's sermon and put into practice this week. And open your Bibles to Genesis 27. We're going to work through this passage together this morning. The very first thing I want to look at is what's required and a blessing from God is touch. What do I mean by touch? Isaac touches his son before he blesses him, before he imparts that blessing. The indication is that Esau had experienced his father's touch before in a meaningful and in an appropriate way. Isaac asks to touch his son before he blesses him. Touch is so important. Touch often begins a blessing. I think of Jesus in Mark chapter 10, the gospel of Mark uh, chapter 10, and also in Matthew 18, Matthew writes about it as well. When Jesus calls the children unto him to bless them, what is the first thing Jesus does? He lays his hands on those children, and then he blesses them. Friends, let me tell you, our young people today, our children today need positive encouraging, God-honoring touch. I think of this summer, I uh, was able to go with some of our young people and some of our um, adults to Camp Good News in Maine. 
This past week, I was going back through my journal. I journaled while, uh, you know, every day I, I have a journal that I write in. And I was reading about the time we were at camp. And I, as I was reading through, my heart was once again broken for what I was reading. I was reading of one little girl that was in my daughter's cabin. She was a senior counselor this year. She had a little girl in her cabin. And the little girl was there. And, and her, the year before, her father had uh, overdosed on drugs and had died. And her mother was in prison. She was in foster care. She was at camp that week. And there were many other children that were at camp that week. They came from similar backgrounds. I was surprised how many kids came from broken homes and were either living in foster care or living with their grandparents because their home life was just devastated. There were other stories that I don't want to repeat this morning of things that had happened to these, be- these, these precious kids. There were kids there, uh, many of you may remember last fall in the state of Maine in Lewiston, there was a, a, a devastating uh, mass shooting that took place. And so any boy or girl who witnessed that, who was a part of that mass shooting and was impacted by it, were given a free week of camp. And so we had kids there that had been involved in that mass shooting. As camp pastor that week, when I would just put my hand on one of the boys' head and, you know, tassel his hair, you know, I, I forgot what that feels like, so it was nice. <laughs> I'd tassel their hair, I'd just give a side hug to one of the little girls. I'd pat one of the boys on the back. Boy, it meant the world to them. That positive touch, touch, a com- often comes with blessing. In fact, years ago, my father and mother gave me a book called Letters to a Young Pastor. It was written by a man named Reverend Calvin Miller. And in that book, he writes about a time that touch transformed a memorial service. He writes, once at a young girl's funeral, I had to make an important decision pertaining to touch. The girl's father was a member of our church, and he was an Air Force serviceman. He was an aide on Air Force One and had flown the president many times. A few generals and lots of upper-class brass attended the funeral. When it came time to review the open casket, at the end of the service, I went to take my customary place at the head of the little casket. Standing in this needy place, I often hug family and friends, particularly at a child's funeral. There is no occasion that more elicits tears and touching than a child's funeral. On this particular occasion, I looked at all the generals that were there and I thought to myself, I must keep myself a respectful distance here. It's not my place to hug a general. (laughs) But as the people began to pass by me, one enlisted man who was a pallbearer came past me and hugged me. He was weeping, and so I hugged him back. The next person at the casket was a general. And when he saw the serviceman weeping for the child, immediately his eyes filled with tears. When he came to me, I took his hand to shake it, whereupon he reached out, grabbed my hand, and pulled me into him. I hugged him as he wept. His open humanity gave all the upper-level military brass permission to hug me, and they did as they came by. Hugging generals was never a goal of mine, he writes, (laughs) But I'm grateful for the ministry of touch, and I hope you yourself might realize that touching is one of the senses, and that, and the one that is easiest to appropriate in following your calling to bless others as God has blessed you. We are called not only to be touched by God, but to positively touch others as we bless them. Remember the prodigal son. Remember the waiting father when the son returned. Here's what the father did according to Luke 15, verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. This is the son. But while he was still a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. We know that's a picture of the heavenly father, isn't it? And that's what the Heavenly Father wants to do for each one of us. He is waiting. He is watching. He wants to run and fall upon us. He wants to touch us with a holy supernatural touch. 
blessings often begin with positive touch. The Father, the Heavenly Father touches us as only he can, and his blessings follow. The Bible says he comforts the afflicted and touches them. Christ, when he blesses, Charles Spurgeon said, Christ, when he blesses, blesses not in word only, but also in deed. The lips of truth cannot promise more than the hands of love will surely give. He has called us to bless the world as we touch the world. (laughs) To touch the world being the hands of Jesus. And when you do, your compassion will be seen more as just a mere pressing of your hand, but it'll be seen as the literal fingers of God on the woes of mankind. The world, friends, gets well when you touch it. Let me say that again. The world gets well when you touch it with the hands of God. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus commissions the 12 and he sends them out. He instructs them to greet the homes with a blessing and with a positive touch. At the ascension, our departing Lord shared with his church the power of his blessing through which he sent them out to bless others. And he remains bound to that commission. In 1 Peter 3, we learn that the New Testament believers were called to lay hands on others, to impart blessings to them. Again, in Acts, when when Philip had been sent to Samaria during the time of, of, of great persecution that was going on in Jerusalem, Philip is sent to Samaria, and while he's there, revival breaks out. Samaritans are coming to Christ by the thousands, and so the church in Jerusalem sends Peter and John into into Samaria, and and they send them to lay hands on the Samaritans so that the Holy Spirit, and to pray for them so that the Holy Spirit will come and fill them and bless them. Touch is an important part of blessing. The second component of blessing is truth. Truth. In verses 28 and 29 of Genesis 27, we read that Isaac wanted to convey a truth to his son about blessing. The truth of what God had in store for him. Truth carries impact. Listen, friends. Truth carries impact, especially when it's repeated. That's why we need to repeat the truth. We repeat it here in the worship center. We repeat it over in the sanctuary, but we also repeat it downstairs to the boys and girls, the young people, the teenagers. We repeat it Sunday morning. We repeat it Wednesday nights. Deuteronomy chapter six says, you shall tell these things. You shall tell these truths to your children and your children's children that they may set their hope in God. Friends, we are still looking for volunteers that will help present these truths to our young people. Although Jacob was not being truthful with his father, Rebecca was not being truthful. The blessings were permanently bound in truth. God was going to fulfill a promise that he had made to Abraham, and God was going to fulfill a promise he made at the beginning with Isaac and Rebekah. You see, we often think illy of Rebekah in this story that we heard read, Pastor Minas read to us. We think illy of Rebekah. She she was deceitful. She tricked Isaac. Here Isaac is trying to do the right thing, and Rebekah tricks him. But don't be so hard on Rebekah, and don't be so easy on Isaac. You see, way back, a couple of chapters before in Genesis 25, Isaac prays to the Lord for his wife. His wife, Rebekah, is is unable to have children. She's barren. And praise God, Isaac had learned from his father's mistake. Remember what his father did did when when his his wife, Sarah, was barren? He slept with her concubine, (laughs) her handmaid, and made it his concubine, and, and he had Ishmael, which was in disobedience to God. Well, Isaac learned from that, so he immediately goes before the Lord and he prays for his wife. God, 
give Rebecca a child and God hears his prayer and he answers. In fact, he doesn't give her one. He gives her two. She has twins within her womb. But you remember in, in Genesis 25, she's in great turmoil. She's having great pain. It feels like those kids will not stop. It feels like they're already fighting in the womb. Think about that, moms. Think about the, when your kids are fighting and you're just like, will you stop? These two had already started fighting in the womb. <laughs> In fact, she goes before the Lord and she cries out because she's in great pain and turmoil over this, this just, she's feeling so uncomfortable. And in verse 23 of chapter 25, the Lord said to her, you're feeling turmoil because two nations are at war in your womb. Two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other and the elder shall serve the younger. The elder shall serve the younger. She gives birth to these two babies. Esau comes out first. And Jacob, Jacob's not, not willing to let him go first, even as an infant in the womb. He grabs right onto his brother's heel. And he comes out right behind his brother, holding onto his heel. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine the turmoil <laughs> that was coming to that family? The sad part is, verse 28 of, 20, of chapter 25, Isaac loved Esau more <laughs> because he was fond of Esau's game, his hunting. But Rebekah loved Jacob. You see, in this story, now go back to chapter 27 and 25, God, they went to God, they prayed. God said, I hear your prayers. Let me answer and tell you what's going on. There's a battle going on. But I want you to understand this. One is going to be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. The one who is to get the blessing is the younger. Here we are two chapters later. Isaac's on his deathbed. What is he doing? <laughs> who does he want to give the blessing to? The older. His favorite, Esau. He's not obeying God. <laughs> He's disobeying God. Now, in this process, don't get me wrong, Rebecca is not doing right. She is being deceitful, and that is not good, and so is Jacob. And yet, in spite of this, God continues to carry out the blessing. Isaac's not heeding God's words. Rebecca remembers the promise. She works to bring it to fruition, but she does it in a deceitful manner. When we try, friends, listen, when we try to go against the truth that is found in God's word, when we disobey God, when we go against the leading of the Holy Spirit, no matter how wonderful the work is that we're doing, it is destined to crumble and fall apart like a house that's built on the sand. If we want God's blessing, we need to operate in obedience to the truth of God's word and in obedience to his Holy Spirit, amen? Without that, I don't care how good the work is we're doing, it is not pleasing to God. Christian Hero and missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, famously once said, and he lived this, he said, God's work must be done in obedience to God's way. And when it is, it will never lack God's blessing. Do you believe that? If so, say amen. Hudson Taylor lived that. He did God's work in obedience to God's way, and God surely blessed him. So blessing begins with touch. Blessing is encompassed. It's embedded in truth. The third component of blessing is treasure. Isaac communicated respect with what he said to his son pertaining the treasure and the blessing that was coming. This said something about how Isaac viewed the treasure that he was passing on. Sadly, Esau did not value the treasure. He didn't value the treasure of his birthright. 
It started even before this event. We read in, in Genesis 25 that Esau had been hunting. Uh, apparently he'd been hunting a long time. He'd been hunting all day long. And when he returns home from the field, the Bible says he was faint. He was hungry. You ever feel that way? You're so hungry you feel faint? Well, Esau comes back and he comes in, he's feeling faint, he's feeling hungry, and after finding that his brother Jacob had already prepared some food for himself, he had prepared a stew, a meat stew for himself, Esau says, feed me, I pray thee, give me some of that red pottage that you are making, I'm faint. Jacob, the heel grabber, <laughs> he sees an opportunity here, he says, okay, sell me your birthright. Give me your birthright. And Esau, who's not thinking rationally because he wants something to fill his stomach, he's hungry, he has a physical need, he says, stupidly, what profit is this birthright to me? What good can a birthright be? Or what good can a birthright do me? <laughs> you see, Esau was a man who cared very little for the long-term treasure that was waiting for him. Instead, he was sensual. He was driven by his senses. Esau could care less about the long-term outcome. He wanted the instant gratification. He wanted, he wants it now. <laughs> he should have jumped back. He should have fled but he failed to do so. And Esau paints a picture, I believe, of people who have little or no concern about the things to come. Even though according to Hebrews 11, verse 20, they both were blessed by Isaac, Esau lost out on more than just his birthright. He also lost out on his father's ultimate blessing, which would have empowered him to prosper in every area of his life, the future things. This blessing would have been an endowment of power, resulting in prosperity and success. You see, friends, sadly, we're, we're like Esau <laughs> at times. We want the Christian walk. We want the Christian faith. We want the church. Well, you've heard me say it before. We want it like Burger King. We want it our way. <laughs> we want it now. We want it our way. That's not the way the blessings of God work. Notice later in verse 34 of chapter 27, after he realizes that he's lost everything, he cries out exceedingly, the Bible says he cries out exceedingly great and a bitter cry, and he says to his father, bless me also, my father. <laughs> bless me also. Bless me indeed. In verse 35 Isaac says, your brother came in with deceit and has taken away the blessing. Once again in verse 34, I mean in verse 38, like he did in verse 34, he says, oh, but father, don't you have a blessing for me? Don't you have something for me? Bless me also, my father, bless me also. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. <laughs> Are we guilty of that sometimes? We're looking to God to bless us, but when the blessing doesn't come in the time or the manner that we were looking for, we cry out, Lord, don't you have something for me? Bless me, Father, bless me. I want it my way, bless me. Crying for sorrow for fleshly things without commitment to the spiritually minded things will result in mistreasure and miss blessing. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, therefore my beloved be steadfast and movable, always excelling in the work of the Lord because you know that the Lord's work, the work that you labor in will not be in vain. That word abounding in the Greek here means to superabound, to excel, to have more abundance, to be better, to have enough to spare to increase, to remain over and above. That's what God desires, but it takes hanging in there and not looking for the instant gratification. 
Sadly, many people in the body of Christ are like Esau and that they don't show much concern about getting the blesser. Instead, they just want the blessings, the sensual things. Author Henry Moore on writing on Esau said, nothing raises the price of a blessing like its removal. Isn't that true? <laughs> blessings begin with touch. Blessings are founded in truth. Blessings come with treasure. The fourth component of blessing is time to come. The future, the hope. Isaac communicated hope. Hope for an extraordinary time to come, a future for his child. We need to do this as well. Verses 28 and 29 of, of this passage of Genesis 27 point solely to the time to come, the future. Everyone, friends, has a future. Blessings, hope, gives something in the future to look forward to. Faith looks to God's handling of the future. And blessing and hope should be a matter of faith. Well, this past year, while we were going through uh, my wife's cancer diagnosis and the umpteen surgeries that, that we went through, one of the overwhelming messages I received, first from Pastor Medes, I'm, Pastor Medes told me this, and then on the heels of Pastor Medes telling me this, many doctors and surgeons and, and care, you know, the caregiving staff in the hospital, they all told me the same thing, and this was a resounding message. It is important that you give your wife, Johanna, hope. Hope can, is the best medicine that we can give. I found that interesting and put it into practice. <laughs> And I saw the difference it was making in her life. In fact, I read an article by the University of Stanford's medical department, a secular university. It's not a Christian university. And I say that because of what I'm going to read here in a moment. The University of Stanford Medical Department writes, for patients with cancer, the future is often unknown, and hope is what keeps them going. Hope is what keeps them, listen, hope is what keeps them alive to endure treatment and social and personal adversities. They'll go on to write in the same article the virtue of hope pertaining to the world's religions. Listen to this. They say, according to Greek mythology, Pandora's box, which brought the evils in the world, held hope in it. The Greeks believed hope was a misery. <laughs> Buddhists teach that Desire is an affliction. Hope is trying to hold on to worldly life and allowing us to seek release from it. Hindus say, hope is the worst of evils for it prolongs the torment of men. Then they write, this is a quote from that article. The Christian belief in contrast is that hope is related to the spirit of goodness as conveyed in the verse, where there is life, there is hope. Then they say, Christianity appears to be the only religion in the world that embraces hope. Isn't that something? <laughs> That's why a secular university. Friends, hope is what God gives us. The blessed hope. That is a blessing for us as believers. George Bernard Shaw is perhaps the most renowned renowned free thinker and atheistic philosopher. In his last writings, he writes, the science to which I penned my faith is bankrupt. It counsels which should have established the millennium, but instead it led directly to the suicide of Europe. I believe the things I wrote about once. In their name, I helped to destroy the faith and hope of, million of wor millions of worshipers in temples and in churches, and I destroyed thousands of creeds. Now listen to what he says. And now they look at me and witness the great tragedy of an atheist who has lost his faith in what he wrote and believed and has lost all hope. How sad. Hebrews 11:20 says, By faith, 
Isaac invoked blessings for a future hope on Jacob and Esau. Talking about the future, the time to come, prepares one for achieving potential and hope in this world. The fifth and last component of blessing is trustworthiness. In verse 37, after realizing that he had mistakenly given the blessing to Jacob, what does Isaac do? Isaac acknowledges his commitment and he is trustworthy to what he said. He does not try to take it back. Trustworthy and commitment provide what is needed for a blessing and for the blessed one to thrive. This includes prayer. This includes opportunities for development. You see, friends, blessings is found in touch, truth, treasure, time to come, and trustworthiness. But sadly, deception tries to anchor itself to these things as well. When it's used inappropriately, these things impart deception. And when we reject these things, the blessing is lost. The curse is then what comes about. So how do we impart deception instead of blessing? Well, it's easy. Take these five things and reverse them. To impart deception, touch inappropriately. Lay truth aside. Disrespect and undervalue the treasures of God and the treasures of life. Present the time to come, the future, as hopeless. And show no trustworthiness or commitment. (laughs) Friends, God has blessings for you. You are his child. He wants to bless you. He wants to rain down on you, Psalm 68, 19, which says, heaven is filled with blessings and daily God loads us with his blessings. What are those blessings? I've I've put some of them at the bottom of your insert. F.E. Marsh has enumerated some of God's blessings. I want you to take these blessings with you this week. Let them touch you. See the truth that's in them. Treasure these blessings. Let them give you hope for the time to come, the future. See the trustworthiness in it. Read through these blessings. Pray over these blessings. Commit these blessings to your heart and see what God has in store for you. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask you for your blessing upon us. We thank you for the extraordinary power that you rain down on each and every one of us. We thank you for the wisdom that you instill in us. We thank you for the profound insight that you desire to give each one of us. Lord, I pray that we would use our blessings in every way, and allow them to go through us and to pour out of us that we would use them to help and serve mankind. May we never forgo these blessings for simple, instant gratification. And may we never let deception get in the way of the blessings. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.